I'm Peter Prono and um, I've known Anthony for a while and I understand that he's written a book. It relates to the nature of surveillance in our society and because he has a speciality with Israel, he has done an incredible book which I've just finished reading, which I would commend to everybody here. It's not only on surveillance, it's on war and weaponry and, and also um, surveillance particularly, the Israelis are very good at it. You're probably listening now. Um, so, the first thing though I'd like to do is to point out that there is an empty chair here on the stage. Uh, that empty chair is meant to represent uh, someone who's missing today, that's Julian Assange, who is in the clink in London, as we all know, detained on the whim of the British government and the Americans, with not enough pressure from Australia. Our hopes keep getting raised that he's about to be released, but now we just don't know. So that's what that chair represents, in case anyone's wondering why we've, we've left it there. Now, Sydney Penn, the Penn Group, which is a literary freedom of expression group, wants to make a statement, and I'd like to invite Claudia, ah, Claudia up onto the stage, and um, I'll give you this mic. Thanks, Peter. Um, I mean, you've sort of said it all, really, just that uh, it's a Penn tradition to have an empty chair at events like this, and the person in the empty chair is an imprisoned writer or uh, publisher or poet. And um, this time around it's, of course, Julian Assange. And uh, in the words of his father, John Shipton, he is really just a slow motion murder happening before our eyes. So uh, we'd just like to call on the US government to drop the charges against Julian and for the Australian government to bring him home. In the words of our own PM, this whole thing needs to be brought to a conclusion. Anthony Lowenstein is a, a many skilled person. He's a writer, he's a journalist, and he's a filmmaker. He's written, he tells me, nine books, which uh, I've got to say I haven't read them all. So, you know, bad, bad cross on my, my score. But he's written on a broad group of uh, issues, uh, Drug Wars, which was a terrific book, um, uh, The War Against Drugs, uh, Disaster Capitalism, which is a terrific book. Um, I'd commend you to have a look at uh, some of his books. They, they are a, a genre of book in Australia that is all too rare. And uh, I think that they're the sort of books that we presume are written in New York and Washington and London, but boy, there's an Australian who's doing those sort of topics here, and I, I really commend you to them. Um, he's also written a lot about his own personal experience uh, uh, with Israel. Um, I don't know, people may have seen the Good Weekend magazine article, which was last week. Um, you know, a very heartfelt, very a terrific story to know uh, about Anthony and his connections to, uh, to Israel. So I'd commend you to pursue that as well. It's online. Um, now, Anthony's current book about to be released this month is the Palestine Laboratory and it, it's, a, it's a deep dive into the technologies of weapons and surveillance that Israel has become uh, a, a master at. So I guess the first question for Anthony today is to, to ask what's this book all about and why have you written it now? Let me first start off by thanking everyone for being here today. It's cold, um, but it's been an amazing day and I'm really wrapped that so many people have come. And I also wanted to start off by acknowledging traditional owners of the land on which we are here today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And to thank Peter for doing it as well. So thank you. No worries, brother. Um, why this book? Well, I've been writing about Israel and Palestine for close to 20 years. And I've been visiting there since 2005. Uh, every three or four years I've been going there reporting from Israel, from Palestine, from the West Bank, from Gaza. From 2016 to 2020, I was living there with my partner and our young child in East Jerusalem. And I think one of the things that struck me, although I'd thought about this before living there, was looking for a way to explain what was happening in Palestine that wasn't just happening on the ground. In other words, so many conflicts around the world are geographically based in that space. 
So, for example, I was living in 2015 with my partner, Ali, in South Sudan. What's happening in South Sudan is horrific, but it's centred in that country. What's happening in Palestine doesn't stay there. Essentially, it's an exportable conflict, an exportable technology which is used by obviously Israel against the Palestinians, but also countless other nations around the world. So the idea behind the book was to try to find a not just a narrative, but an explanatory way of saying to a reader what stays, what's happening in Palestine is going global. And what I mean by that is the use of incredible spyware, drones, um, facial recognition technologies. And what Israel's doing, obviously it has a ready-made population under occupation, the Palestinians have been occupied for it's the longest occupation in modern times. And essentially they're guinea pigs. And there are countless examples, and the book goes into that, about what those tools and technologies are which have been used by Israel so successfully from their perspective and why so many other nations want that those tools and technology. So in brief, it's about that, but also it's also briefly about the concept of ethno-nationalism, that Israel is undeniably the most successful, I use that term loosely, ethno-nationalist state in the world. It is a proudly Jewish majority state. It discriminates against non-Jews. And the allure that that is from many other nations is increasingly clear. It's clear that nations like India and Hungary and others are close to Israel, not just because they're getting weapons. There's an ideological affinity between Israel and other ethno-nationalist states. And there's a reason why much of the global far right, who traditionally, of course, hate Jews, neo-Nazis and others, you regularly find at those protests the Israeli flag, which on, at first might seem crazy, like why would the far right, who don't like Jews, like Israel? They don't like Jews. <laughs> what they like is the concept of what Israel is doing. They like the idea of a proudly unapologetic far-right government that says Jews are the best and everybody else will be a second-class citizen. They want to create in their own territory a Christian ethno-nationalist state. So therefore, I have a quote in there from Richard Spencer, who was a so-called alt-right leader a few years ago, who said, I'm a white Zionist. And that term, I think, really goes to the heart of it here, that there is a sense that he doesn't like Jews at all, but he does like what Israel's doing to Muslims and Palestinians, and he wants to create that as well in his deluded worldview in the US or somewhere else. One of the things I, I found in the book was that uh, I didn't know about as much of the surveillance that you write about. I didn't know about the technologies, the companies, just the comprehensive nature of Israeli companies and, and what they're doing and the size of the companies and that they're such one of the largest exporters of this sort of technology in the world. Can you run through a couple of good, solid, meat and veg examples of the sorts of technology you were talking about? Look, on the one hand, it is strange, right, that a country which is tiny, really, on the global perspective is now the 10th biggest arms exporter in the world. In terms of spyware, spyware meaning hacking tools, people's ability to better listen to your everything in your phone, Israel has the top two or three companies. I mean, the most famous example, which I go into detail in the book, is NSO Group's Pegasus, which you may have heard of, some of you here. Pegasus essentially is a tool where if your phone is hacked by this um, tool, everything on your phone is taken, um, literally everything. So... Um, photos, texts, emails, nothing is secured, regardless of what kind of, whether you think you might use Signal and that keeps you secure as an app, nothing is protected if your phone is compromised. And increasingly the technology is so sophisticated that it can take control of your phone, of your camera and your um, microphone and your phone. So essentially it becomes a recording device against yourself um, without you knowing. There's no way to actually know unless there's a forensics done on your phone, which most people, of course, can't afford. So NSO Group is one of the more infamous examples, but there are many, many others. And it's interesting that it's worth saying here that so many of these companies, the people who are running them and developing them have come from the Israeli military because they've spent years in the so-called intelligence units of the IDF surveilling Palestinians. Like, that, that's, their, that's their day job. So everything, every, every aspect of Palestinian life 
where they go, who they're speaking to, who they're having sex with, all that is monitored by Israel. And there's lots and lots of examples, and I put some of those in the book, of Palestinians who have, for example, been cheating on their wife or maybe having a gay affair, whatever it may be. Israel discovers that through surveillance technology and therefore blackmails that person to say, unless you work for us, we're going to tell your wife or tell your you know, father or whatever it may be. So those companies are part of that. Elbus is the most well-known Israeli defence company. It is the biggest in the country and its work is everything from drones which operate both in over Gaza, which operate in, by, by the EU across the Mediterranean. Um, Elbert also has a lot of amazing surveillance towers across the US-Mexico border and that's in some ways I think one of the better examples of what the Palestine Laboratory is, that the reason the US wanted to have Israeli surveillance tech is because they saw how, in inverted commas, effective it was in Palestine. Right? So, yeah, there's some of the examples. There are many more. I discovered, to my amazement, that, uh, that Israel exports drones to Russia and sells rifles to China. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's basically... No, as far as we're aware, there's literally... You can count on one hand nations that Israel won't sell to or hasn't sold to now. As far as I'm aware, they've never sold to, say, North Korea, as far as we know. Interest, yes. Interestingly <laughs> enough, they also sell to Australia. So they do. I got going. I picked one of the technologies in your book and decided to do a bit of Googling. Yes. And up popped Celebrite. Yes. And you can talk about Celebrite in a minute. But what I found is this company uh, allows your phone to be opened up and downloaded the entire data read. So that'll be all your geolocations for the last time until you, down, you know, erase them. So without, without you knowing it. It Absolutely. If you hand over your phone at the, at the airport, they can plug it in and download the contents if they use Celebrite. So I just thought, oh, I wonder who uses Celebrite in Australia. Popped it into Google, found Tender, the Australian contracts, federal government contracts page, 120 contracts for Celebrite over the past 10 years. Most of them, the Defence Department, Defence Department, downloading mobile phones, the AFP, um, home Affairs, obviously, that's um, ASIO, and Services Australia. Services that's Australia, it helps them track down uh, sole parents who are having their partner live in their place. Um, and I actually found a case where it was used for that. They're using Celebrite. The Brittany Higgins case in Canberra, Celebrite. All of these cases drag in Celebrite. There's another case up in Toowoomba at the moment. People may have seen a rape case, an alleged rape case. The, um, the alleged victim handed over her phone to police who downloaded the entire contents of the victim's phone. This is not the alleged rapist, of the alleged victim's phone. The, the alleged rapist then sought access to it and got access to it. And on that phone was a copy of the forensic report done after her alleged rape. So we've got a company that has fine-tuned its abilities in the Gaza Strip being used on to the detriment of rape victims in Australia. So Celebrite, are they a moral company? Very moral. <laughs> the most moral. But what's so interesting is about those examples, and there are literally millions of others, is that it's almost like these companies have been depoliticised because most people would have no idea, the, I mean, the Australian government would know, of course, but most people have no idea that company X from Israel, how did they get that experience? It wasn't just done in a lab, I mean, in an actual like, scientific lab, it was done actually literally in Palestine. Like, this is how it works. So the depoliticised nature of how so many countries, I mean, what I say in the book is over 130 countries in the world have used a form of Israeli defence equipment, surveillance tech or repressive tech. Now, that's the majority of countries in the world by far. Democracies and dictatorships, there's very few countries that haven't. Now, some people would have everything from more so-called benign weapons like guns, not that guns can't do damage, but guns. Other countries have got drones, spyware. Um, there's a range of technologies. And this in some ways, and this is what I try to talk about in the book, this gives Israel an insurance policy, in a way, politically, because there are so-called smarter people in Israel realise that a lot of people in the world don't like the occupation. No kidding. 
However, if you're selling huge amounts of surveillance tech to nations that are desperate for it, the thinking within Israel and in these defence circles are, well, they're less likely to want to criticise us when it really matters. And although, yes, if you see the UN vote every six months, the vast bulk of the world supports Palestine. There's like six countries on one side, Australia, Palau, Micronesia, the US and Israel, and then the rest of the world. So yes, that is certainly, on the face of it, seems like Israel's so isolated, but actually they're not. Not isolated at all. There is no accountability, and this really, in some ways, is, I don't know if I use the word in the book, I think I do, it's impunity. Impunity is the issue here, that you can, as a state, commit gross human rights abuses against your own population, Palestinians, and also sell that technology. And one of the things that is so gross about this is that often the marketing is done to, to sort of show how effective it's been in, say, Gaza or in, say, the West Bank. So it's so-called battle-tested. And it's often said that way. I mean, I haven't got photos in the book, sadly, but people can find this stuff online. There are lots and lots of examples of Israeli companies that have operated either surveillance technology or deadly weapons in Palestine saying how effective it was and therefore country X or country Y should buy it. So that's happening at, at arms fairs in Australia? Absolute, uh, in, well, a lot of Israeli surveillance firms are selling their stuff here, mm. yes. Mm. Nice. El amongst elsewhere, yeah. Yeah. Try to explain why Israel is able to get a free pass. I mean, is it, is it that, that, that there's a... Um, that it's a self-supporting outpost of the US in the Middle East? Is that the, is it a geopolitical thing that's going on that gives them a free pass, or what? what is it? Look, that is one of them, and therefore many Western states that are US allies are content to be very good friends with Israel, Australia, much of Europe and elsewhere. So that's part of it. But I think it's more than that. I think there are... For example, nations that are colonial states themselves have an affinity, ideologically. Australia wouldn't say that, obviously, but I think that definitely is part of it. So Canada, uh, New Zealand, um, Australia and others, I think, have a, the US, have a, an affinity. And I think that's part of it. I think there's also, to me, no doubt that the Holocaust does play a part here. Holocaust was decades ago. It's, it's history. But... I think for a lot of states, there is still this almost, I think, underlying belief that it's inappropriate to be too critical of Israel as a Jewish majority state because of what happened to the Jews in World War II. That's also a factor, I think. And I think a lot of it has been worse than since 9-11. I mean, this, this, was, this was happening for decades, but 9-11 has really accelerated these trends. As I say in the book, the so-called US-led war on terror after 9-11, the playbook was written by Israel decades before. America didn't make this up on 9 after 9-11. This came so much of it, not just the behaviour of the US after 9-11, but the rhetoric. The rhetoric against Muslims and terrorists, all that language, Israel had been using that for decades. So the US didn't wholly copy it, but it was deeply inspired by it to the point where in the last 20 years you have all these American military officers and police forces going to Israel for training. Do, do you think that, um, that the degree of secrecy that exists around the weapons and surveillance industry allows for uh, the preservation of the type of government that exists in Israel uh, do you think do you think that that national security state, deep state that exists in Israel, intentionally must keep that type of government in power to keep doing service to the rest of the world's repressive regimes? Yes, is the short answer. Okay, but the you. slightly <laughs> longer the slightly longer answer is that, to me, one of the key ways that Israel has maintained its dominance both within its own borders and beyond for so long is because there's actually remarkably little dissent within Israel itself. It's actually quite interesting. Obviously, there are people who are critical. I'm not saying there are not. There are. But in general, this is one small 
example, in the last few months, many people here will have seen these mass protests across Israel against the Netanyahu's government attempt to reform, so to speak, the Supreme Court and what that might mean for democracy. Okay. But firstly, democracy for whom? There are virtually no Palestinians protesting. There are a handful of very small percentage of Israeli Jewish leftists who protest and I salute them for doing so, who are critical, who talk about while the occupation continues, there can never be true democracy. But the vast, vast majority of Israeli Jewish people don't see it that way. For them, it's maintaining that dominance of a Jewish majority democracy, so-called democracy. And they're able to sustain that for so long because, A, you had Jewish diaspora support, almost uncritically for decades. Yes, the US is a key ally, but also the US and Israel have a which I know we might talk about, have a curious relationship. They're friends, but they also don't really trust each other, weirdly. So, yeah, I mean, what they mean by that is that, yes, um, they're both selling each other huge amounts of technology and weapons and America provides shelter to Israel in many international forums, including the UN, but America and Israel are both massively spying on each other hugely spying on each other. So, for example, the latest figures that I had seen in the writing of this book was that every day in the NSA there are at least 400 Americans that, are, that their job is to spy on Israel, at least. And you can be rest assured in the it's happening the other way around as well. So they're good friends, but good friends who don't really entirely trust each other 100%. So, so they, you know, you watch your enemy, but you watch your friends closely. Absolutely. <laughs> so with the United States... Um, uh, critical of Israel in many forums, often makes some words about settlements. Doesn't do a lot, but makes words about settlements, makes press conferences statements. Obviously, for the United States, Israel is an essential part of the United States' present presence as an imperial power in the world. Now, given that that imperial power is being challenged by Russia and China, Israel remains a firm part of supporting America's effort. So what are the prospects for democracy and openness in Israel as a result of its position with the US? Um, in the short to medium term, close to zero. And I say that because although, of course, history is, you know, the future is not written and that's always the caveat, but Israel has generally been on a certain trajectory for quite a while. Governments come and go, prime ministers change, all that's true. But I think a lot of people in the West who talk about this issue think Netanyahu is this crazy extremist, he's got a government full of extremists. All that's true. But it's kind of not really the problem. In other words, Netanyahu here is not the problem. He's terrible, he's racist, he's an enabler of occupation. All that's undeniably correct. But... The last government, when he wasn't Prime Minister, in fact, there was more violence against Palestinians in that year. My point being that there are trends here to massively continue to expand settlements. At the moment, there are roughly 750,000 Jewish settlers in occupied territory. So a so-called two-state solution is over. I mean, you could argue it was never going to happen, but now that window is very much closed. It is currently a one-state so-called solution, but it's an apartheid state. And there are government ministers who openly talk about wanting one or two million settlers, and I think it's very conceivable in years to come, unless there is some kind of unpredictable war or something that happens that, again, you know, impossible to predict, I would not be surprised if you start seeing, because Israel is finding it harder and harder to get Jews to move to the West Bank. There's only so many people around the world who are willing to move to areas which are at times quite dangerous. But I do think you will find evangelical Christians who are dying to go there. And in fact, a lot of Israelis are increasingly saying, the ones who support the occupation and the status quo, so liberal Jews in America are increasingly squeamish about what's happening. Who cares? In other words, for, for decades they were the backbone of, of support in the US for Israel. But if they melt away, they're more critical now, these young Jews, which is increasingly true, are anti-Zionist or whatever it may be, this will be replaced by evangelical support. 
And that doesn't really make much of a difference, frankly, whether it's Joe Biden in the White House or Donald Trump. Trump accelerated what was already happening. He was terrible, to be sure. But you think Biden's done anything differently? I mean, yes, as you said, they now and then put out a, pre a statement saying, we very much urge all parties to come together and please don't build settlements. And Israel says, you know, screw you, we'll keep building them. Now, and, the, you know, again, what is just finally really concerning is that Palestinians have, on one level, fewer and fewer friends. In civil society globally, support for Palestine has never been high. That is undeniably true. You had a poll this year, Gallup poll in the US, which found for the first time ever that a majority of Democratic voters in America supported Palestinians more than Israelis. That's significant now. It's not reflected so far in Joe Biden's policies. But there is a shift going on in the US. There's no doubt about that including in the Jewish community. But globally, the US is mostly on Israel's side. The EU puts out press releases and expresses deep concern about settlements and does nothing because the EU is Israel's biggest trading partner. The Arab countries are increasingly in bed with Israel because they're desperate for Israeli surveillance technology. So where is this, at the moment at least, international pressure coming from if it's not civil society. Mm. I don't see it at the moment. I'm not saying it can now happen, but well, at the moment it's not happening. It's interesting that you say that civil society is coming around more to the Palestinian cause, and if we had real democracy, then perhaps we'd have policies that reflect that. You've got the Israeli surveillance state and its export of surveillance technology being used to keep that in place, to keep democracy, the functioning of democracy, down. I mean, the lowy polls show us that most of Australia, or the majority of Australians, don't want to be in the US alliance, don't want to go to war with China. They want to be a, a non aligned, uh, armed, neutral country. I mean, all of these things, democracy, if it worked, would allow. Now, the technology Israel is exporting, obviously, it's used in the West Bank and Palestine, but clearly, the, the attractions must be enormous to use that in Western democracies. Hugely. And one of the things that I guess I wasn't easily shocked, but I was a bit shocked in the writing and researching of this book was how ubiquitous Israeli surveillance tech and weapons are around the world. I mean, as I said, there are so many examples, and I won't bore you with all with them, but literally if you think of the worst crimes and conflicts in the last 50 years... Pretty much every single one, and again, the US, of course, was there as well. I'm not excusing them. America is still, by the way, the world's biggest arms dealer. About 40% of the world's weapons are exported from the US. So Israel, I mean, the US is still king. Yep. Let's be clear on that. Israel's only 10th. Yep. But America's a bit bigger. And let's not forget, as I say in the book, that the, the US used Iraq and Afghanistan also as a testing ground for weapons. And in fact, the US and other nations are using the current war in Ukraine also as a testing ground for weapons. That's been made very clear by a number of nations. They're testing various... This is obviously mostly on the Ukrainian. The weapons they're giving to Ukraine. So Israel's testing ground is different from an all-out war because it's it's more about repression and yes. pressurising and removing an unwanted population Yes. compared to America's experience, which is, as we know, full-on uh, invasions and wars more often. It is, but so, that... But that those, that defence equipment and that surveillance tech always comes home. Mm. And you see this in the US in the last two decades, although it existed before 9-11, of US police forces buying huge amounts of military-grade defence equipment, spyware, including from Israel. Now, the US, many American police forces probably didn't need necessarily that technology to be awful and racist and discriminatory, of course. They didn't know, they didn't need to go to Israel to get training to be racist. There was racism, obviously, long before that. But the ubiquitous nature of Israeli surveillance technology, I mean, they were selling weapons to Rwanda during the genocide. They were selling weapons and spyware to the Myanmar regime when they were committing a genocide. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And again, other countries have done that too. It's not just Israel, the US again being king. But it's pretty hard then to make an argument, as Israel and its supporters do, 
that we are this thriving democracy in the heart of the Middle East. I mean, they are exporting the worst forms of repression around the world, but again, with the allure that they have, in inverted commas, controlled Palestinians so successfully for so long, that other countries are desperate for that technology to repress their own people. So just briefly, I mean, Mexico is a good example of this. Mexico is the biggest user of Israeli spyware by far. This is Mexico both in so-called right-wing governments and the current left-wing government, by far. The current government denies it, but it's bullshit. They're using it, and there's evidence for that. Is that cracking down on the drug war? Is it well, initially, that, exactly. It was bought in the mid, in the, around 2011, 2012, um, to go after people like El Chapo. Right. And the whole story, I won't bore you with it now, but if you guys remember when that crazy story, remember Sean Penn yeah. ended up going to sort of have a meeting with, with El Chapo? There was a key reason why El Chapo was captured because their phones had been hacked by Israeli spyware. It's kind of a crazy story. But Mexico is obsessed with this technology to go after dissidents, human rights workers, all sorts of people. So Mexico's appeal for Israel is not that Mexico wants to become an ethno-nationalist state. It just has lots of problems with drugs and repression, for sure. But there are other countries like India, and I think it's important to mention that India is now the world's biggest country. It's overtaking China. It is a self-described democracy, but frankly, arguably not. It has a fundamentalist government that is increasingly keen to, and there's key members of that government who are talking about genocide against Muslims. It's a key ally of Australia, of the US and others, because it's not China. It's not China. And yet, Israel and India are incredibly close to each other at the moment. I mean, Modi and Netanyahu have, there's a real bromance going on there. There's shots of them kind of kicking, um, waving their feet in the water and beaches. It is crazy, but not surprising in a way because there is an ideological affinity. It's very much to me like, I think the best comparison is Israel and apartheid South Africa who are very, very close. They're inspiring each other. So India doesn't need Israel to be repressive. But it's clear that Indian officials are openly saying, we admire what you're doing in the West Bank. We want to do something similar in Kashmir. <laughs> and in fact, that's what India is increasingly doing. They are bringing more and more Hindus to settle Muslim areas in Kashmir yeah. to dilute the Muslim majority populations. Now, it's we, probably worse than, uh, than for the Uyghurs. Well, I mean, look, there are so... Exactly, look, there are, and I talk actually about China. You don't have to get into it if you don't want, but about the Chinese repression situation as well, that there is, I think in the West, and only very recently, this deep concern about Chinese repression internally and externally, mm. the argument that for all the reasons that people here will know, I won't go into it. But what I say in the book is a few things briefly. One, until very, very recently, Western countries were going to Xinjiang to get advice from China how to fight a war on terror. That only changed about four or five years ago, A. And B, if we're worried, if, I say we, if the West or certain people in the West are concerned about China exporting, which they are sometimes doing now, their own repressive surveillance technology, Israel is exporting way, way more of it. Not even a comparison. And yet the, there's not much outrage, unless I've missed it, about Israeli repressive tech, but there is a lot of, I'd say, faux fear about Chinese repression. I'm not saying there's not repression in China, there is, but I'm saying that there's much more concern expressed about what they're doing globally than what yeah. Israel is. Yeah, the West certainly knows how to select its enemies. Yeah. With, um, with the media's role here in, in covering these sorts of uh, technologies and, and industries that, that Israel promotes, weapons and surveillance technology. The media coverage doesn't really focus on that. It focuses on the brutalities. And we can't deny we see a fair bit of bombings and repression uh, in Palestine, in uh, Gaza and the West Bank. Um, is that a net positive or a net negative for Israel? In, in that sort of coverage? Does it actually affect them negatively or is it a positive? I have a chapter in the book all about social media because I think actually social media has fundamentally changed the game here. 
And what I mean by that is that for decades and decades, with some exceptions, it was very rare to read a Palestinian voice in the media. When I say the media, Australia, US, UK, of course there are exceptions, obviously, but in general. And there was a reason why many of those states supported Israel. Mm. What's happened in the last 15 years, and this I think very much goes along the line of explaining why many Western states, public opinion-wise, has shifted, it's much more difficult to censor or challenge a Palestinian in Palestine saying what's happening to them on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. It's there. You can deny the reality, but it is happening, and people are seeing that all over the world. Gaza's being bombed. There are people literally live tweeting it. You know, it's Palestinians I'm talking about, and that's important because Israel increasingly cannot control that narrative. And what they're doing to challenge that, as I go in detail on the book, is to put massive pressure on these social media companies. Palestinian accounts are regularly censored or removed, their accounts are often shadow banned, which means that often they're not, you know, you wouldn't see them on your feed if you use Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, whatever, your social media um, drug is of choice. And the impact of that I think is almost, I would say, slightly desperate, but it's not entirely, I understand why Israel would be doing that because they're not controlling the narrative anymore as much as they did. I'm not minimising the fact that in general I think much of our media is still not necessarily blindly pro-Israel but scared of being too critical. And we haven't yet reached our South Africa moment. What I mean by that is that, I'm sure most people here will know, but for decades and decades and decades, this is mostly before my time, but in general, having written a lot about it in the book, Yes, there was obviously an anti anti-apartheid movement, absolutely, which was key in ending that regime. But in terms of a leadership government level, many, many countries supported South Africa you know, until quite late in the peace, including, of course, Israel. But at some point there was a, it didn't happen one day, but there was a point where there was a, almost like a tipping point, right, where there was a sense that South Africa was almost given a choice of sorts. And as, as I often say, Israel won't wake up one day and say, geez, occupation's pretty terrible, we better give it up. It's not going to happen that way. It only will happen with massive, in my view, economic pressure. Boycotts, sanctions, divestment. It's the only way. And that system is not perfect either, and there is a BDS movement which is growing. It's relatively small, hasn't had massive practical impact on Israel. I mean, Israel's scared of the BDS movement, but Israel's economy is doing relatively well, yeah. but that could change. And you have now, I don't want to exaggerate the importance of this, but there are now at least some people in the US Congress, 10, 11 people, who do talk about curtailing military aid to Israel. I mean, it's still pretty piss weak, but it's something. I mean, having worked at the ABC, I've seen the reluctance to cover yeah. all sorts of issues to do with Israel, the fear of the Jewish lobby, uh, is palpable in the corridors of the ABC. And um, I know that the bar to get stories on that done is much, much higher than it is to do a negative story about China. So is is the... You used, used the term earlier, ethno-nationalism, and I'm not quite sure I fully understand it. Is that just fascism? <laughs> well, yes, it's certainly fascist. Um, wouldn't want to live under it fascist or ethno-nationalist regime. What, what's the difference for you? Because you were saying that Israel's changing and a lot of you know, right-wing Christians may be moving in, mm. so that's kind of changing that mix a bit, isn't it? It's changing the mix, but a lot of powerful evangelicals have no issue, at least until the second coming of Christ, <laughs> with a Jewish majority state. I mean, you have now and have for a number of years often evangelicals going to the West Bank and helping settlers in their wineries. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, you can book those trips now if you're so desired to, you know, want to do so. Um, what I guess I mean by ethno-nationalism, also I didn't come up with that term, but mm. ethno-nationalism essentially would mean, and Israel has said is the premier global example of this, is a regime or ideology which preferences one people over another. Fascism. Which is fascist. Yeah. 
Um, so you, I could use fascist, but I, I prefer ethno-nationalism because... And the nationalism part refers to, what, the militaristic, the, lack of, the crushing of, of uh, opposition? Yes. Well, I mean, I mean, Israel is a very proudly, in their perspective, nationalistic state, not unique to Israel, I mean, so is parts of the US, a lot of other countries are. But there's not many other countries on the planet at the moment that are proudly discriminated against other people based on what I would call just a race. I'm not saying there's not massive discrimination in lots of countries around the world. Of course there are. But what you see Israel doing and wanting to export, as I said, when Israel's exporting technology and surveillance, that's one thing. That's obviously a financial aspect. And also, try to, as I said before, an insurance policy. But when you're exporting the idea of ethno-nationalism to others, you're saying to some extent what is possible. What you can get away with, because no one's stopping Israel, sure. and India, for example, under Modi, is the to me the most concerning example at the moment in the world of another country which is trying to go down a very similar path. Mm. A country which, by the way, used to be much more pro-Palestinian and has become now very, very pro-Israel, mm. if you can call it that. So I think the and also the allure of some people to ethno-nationalism, I fear, is going to be one of the challenges of this century. In many nations. How ironic that yeah. the descendants of the Warsaw Ghetto mm -hmm. and elsewhere yeah. are now the proud occupants waving the banner for ethno-nationalism, selling repressive technologies around the world to 130-odd countries. And have, and have built themselves, basically they've walled themselves in <laughs> into a ghetto. Yeah. I mean, they don't obviously call it that, yeah. but I mean, that's essentially what it is. There is a pretty much various walls, literal walls, around most of the Israel's border, which of course Israel's never accepted those borders, but nonetheless, the, the, the borders that most of us would see on a map. With your Jewish heritage, though, does, is this an issue that gets debated within the community? This, this idea well, that the descendants of the ghettos are now creating their own Gaza Strip as a ghetto? Like, how does this get worked out at the breakfast table. It's normally we wait till dinner to have those <laughs> conversations. But, look, this is, I mean, obviously my Good Weekend piece last yeah. weekend and I've written about this a lot over the years. This is, to me, one of the profound moral failings of my, if you can call it my people, so to speak, the Jewish people of the mm. last hundred years. Mm. It is a complete moral collapse that you have far, far too many Jews, still I would say probably the majority of Jews, around 14 million Jews in the world now, give or take, half roughly in Israel, half roughly in the US, and obviously in various other parts. But it's mostly mostly divided between two nations in the world, Israel and, and the US. That, yes, there's a growing Jewish descent, all that's true, mostly outside of Israel. In fact, Israeli Jewish population is becoming much more right-wing sadly. But I have obviously spent 20 years, not, obviously not all my work has been about this issue, but of, amongst others, and I'm not the only Jewish person by any means saying this and writing about it, there are many others, of basically trying to shame the Jewish establishment, critique them, embarrass them, outrage them, piss them off, to say to the wider community, we in the community are complicit we are complicit with what's going on. When I say we, the Jewish community establishment leadership is complicit in what is going on over there. It's not solely happening because a Jewish leader lives and breathes in Sydney, obviously, but they are central to that support and they're central to putting endless amounts of pressure on politicians and journalists. I mean, as some people here may know and those who don't, this may open your eyes, that... Israel lobby groups are some of the biggest spenders on free trips to Israel for journalists and politicians. Happens all the time. There was a short break during COVID. It's been going on for decades and decades. And that is not the only way, but a, a key way that so-called Israel support is built on. This is Labor and Liberal. This is journalists across the political board from what we call now, you know, the Herald, the Age, the Murdoch Press. This is how, this is how I guess I would say, how you manufacture, manufacture consent. Mm. Mm. 
Because most of those journalists and politicians who are going there, they come back like weird robots. It's like embedding journalists in, in a military. Uh, Absolutely. They cannot help but start to feel empathy for the Indeed. people who are being hospitable. To However, them. and I agree with that, and I think there is a journalist who only goes to a war zone and only embeds in, say, Afghanistan or Iraq and doesn't, by the way, happen to speak to any Iraqis yeah. or Afghans, is not a journalist, yeah. right? And if you go to Israel as a politician or a journalist and you spend literally five minutes in Palestine and a lot more in Israel itself, you ain't a journalist. Go back to the hotel and have dinner with your hosts. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, Fisk used to call this hotel journalism. I mean, that's kind of often what it is. It's like people kind of they have a great time in the hotels because they're being wined and dined. They're being romanced. Incredible. And as we know, uh, MPs are targeted. I think it's a third of our current federal MPs in the last couple of years have t accepted free luxury trips overseas. Yes. One third. And it's an interesting. Uh, Peter and I, for those who don't know, are the co-founders of Declassified Australia, a website you should all read and support. And we've done a few stories about the issue of this particular one. Over the last years, the countries that are getting the most trips from politicians and journalists, US, Israel, Taiwan. And I do think that explains a lot about a lot. It explains a lot about how there has been this quiet radical shift in the last years around obviously China, Taiwan, the US alliance, Israel. And I think it, when you have all these people taking free trips, who mostly, by the way, don't acknowledge it or talk about it in that way, then it does clearly impact, right, how, how they're either doing politics or how they're writing about these issues. Mm. And I think as, as a journalist myself, I sort of think that I don't know, as I said before, I think anyone who takes a free trip, there needs to be a, either a damn good reason to do it, and if you don't spend more time in places that are not on the tour, then you're not a journalist or a real politician. And you should put it on your LinkedIn account as well, because they don't tell many people. Um, I'll make this my last question to you, Anthony, before we open up for a couple of questions. I think we're about right on timing. Um, in, in terms of what non-Jews can do, I think a lot of non-Jews are nervous about criticising Jews, just as yes. people, you know, at the moment very topically with The Voice, people are nervous about criticising Aboriginal people. And that's quite a spectacular resignation from the ABC or stepping down from the ABC of an Aboriginal person at the moment. Now, people don't feel that, uh, that criticism can be made easily because they're continually being told they're anti-Semitic. What's, what's the answer there? What, what is the answer to, to dealing with that? You know, the way I always answer this question, because I get it quite a lot, actually, is that anti-Semitism obviously is real. That might be an obvious thing to say, but anti-Semitism does exist. It is real. In certain parts of the world, actually, it's getting worse. Real anti-Semitism. I'm not talking about a lot of uh, pro-Israel groups frame anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism, which I don't think it is at all. But I mean actual Jew hatred. It's real and it's actually getting worse in certain parts of the world. And that worries me as a Jewish person. Hasn't there been some effort to quantify a definition of anti-Semitism, which well, would include being anti-Israeli foreign policy? Yeah, Would well, I, I mean, this... Yeah, there, there, yes, there, is, there are attempts to try to... Um, put very clear boundaries about what is acceptable to discuss around Israel and Palestine. It's called the IHRA definition, which many governments and universities and others are being encouraged or pressured to adopt. Mm. So if you as a student or an individual are deemed to be too critical of Israel, if you don't accept Israel's right to exist, so to speak, as a Jewish state, then you're apparently beyond the pale and can be um, fined. I mean, it's, anyway, I think it's crazy. Look, I think what I often say to people around this issue is that expressing support for Palestinians or being critical of Israel doesn't make you anti-Semitic. It's obvious to say that, but it's important to be said. There are lines that can be crossed. As I said, if one says, you know, all the Jews in the world are causing the problems or, you know, that Israel is the source of all the world's problems. Obviously, that's bullshit and simply not true. And that's probably anti-Semitic. Is anti-Semitic. But 
One thing I found in my work over the years, and this again, even after my good weekend piece last weekend, I've been literally overwhelmed with mostly positive. There's been some charming nutters who have written to me, but mostly very Jews and non-Jews writing to me saying, the non-Jews mostly saying, we are often, as you just said, Peter, wondering how do we talk about this issue? We are pained about what's happening in Palestine. We're not anti-Semitic. I got no indication of anyone who wrote to me, as much as you can tell on an email, was anti-Semitic at all. And I sort of said, well, raise your voice up. There are lots of organisations you can be involved with. You can go to rallies. You can write letters. You can speak about it. You can encourage people to divest, boycott and sanction Israel. There are ways to do things. Speak about it. Speak about it in your community. Your community meaning whoever you're with. Um, visit Palestine if you can afford that, if you can travel there. See what is happening with your own eyes. There are ways to do things to... I mean, anti-Semitism has been weaponized, mm. And this, to me, is one of the most dangerous trends in the last few decades because if you weaponize anti-Semitism, you diminish the real risk of actual anti-Semitism. And one of the things I said in my Good Weekend piece, which very a number of uh, people have written both to the paper and also to me, being outraged. And I said essentially that Israel, Israeli actions contribute to anti-Semitism. Yeah. It doesn't make it okay to be anti-Semitic, obviously not. But it's like saying after 9-11 and the US criminal wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a growth in anti-American sentiment. No kidding. It doesn't mean everyone wanted to kill Americans everywhere, but there was a sense that people were pissed off with what... America was doing in those countries and elsewhere. And there is undeniably a lot of people who feel incredibly angry with what Israel is doing. And if Israel claims, as it does, to speak for all Jews in the world, that's what Israel does. We are the Jewish state. For those who don't know, I could go to Israel tomorrow, if you let me in, and within two or three months I would have a passport. I could be a full citizen. Even, because if, even if you're a black Jew from Africa? Well, that could be trickier. Yeah, okay. yeah. There are. There's been a long history of a lot of racism about other Jews who are not white. Absolutely. But in general, if I go there tomorrow as a Jew, my mother was Jewish. Um, I could be a citizen, and a Palestinian who probably has far more connection to the land does not have that right so at all. So it's a kind of supremacy. It's Jewish. No, it's proudly Jewish supremacy. So, but supremacy based on skin tone, so you could kind of call it white supremacy. Well, I mean, and there's a re and there is a reason why, as I said before, a lot of white supremacist groups love Israel. There's a reason for that. On the face of it, I know it sounds crazy, but that is, this is the love of ethno nationalism. Wow. So, as I said, it's not accidental that many of these far right rallies in the US, in Australia, in Europe, in Germany. Yeah. of neo-Nazis are often waving the Israeli flag. Oh and that alliance has been far too little condemned by Israel, mm. which I think speaks volumes about the kind of friends that they want. We'll see if the, the boys in their black shirts down in Melbourne start, right, start waving the, the Star of David. That'll be interesting. <laughs> Look, we've come a, a bit of a journey here from uh, you know your book and, and the sort of technology being made and... It's been great talking. I think we'll open it up to a few questions, if that's okay, if you're happy to accept them. We've got a roving mic. So one thing with questions is that they're questions, not speeches. Thank you. If you went back to Israel and in your contacts with, say, Jewish people around the world, having written books like that, are you regarded as a traitor? Well, I think a lot of, well, some, obviously it's hard to quantify exactly how many think that, but yes, there are definitely, I got that in the, in the last week after my Good Weekend piece, and I've been having it for 20 years, that there are a number of Jewish people, I mean, I can't say how many, but a sizable minority, vocal minority, I would say, who regard my politics on this issue as traitorous, I'm accused of being a Nazi, I'm accused of being an Arab lover, which somehow I don't know how that's a bad thing, but apparently it is. Um, in other words, I'm basically being traitorous to my own people because apparently in that deluded worldview, unless you are uncritically supportive, or more importantly, if you, they would say, well, you can be critical, but you're anti-Zionist. 
an anti-Zionist, meaning that I don't believe in the concept of a Jewish state. I believe Jews, Jews have the right to live in safety. Of course they do. But the idea of a Jewish state is by definition discriminatory. And I say the same thing, by the way, about a Muslim majority state or a, any state that discriminates against the majority population. I mean, it's not, it's not just because it's Israel. India is a Hindu fundamentalist state that discriminates against Muslims. I'm equally opposed to that. But the, 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 the attempt to try to smear or silence or criticise or um, quash critical Jewish voices, I don't think really works. It definitely has an impact on some people. And I know I get messages regularly from people who say to me, I can't speak about this, Jewish people, I can't speak about this with my husband, with my wife, with my kids. In other words, if their politics is different on this question, it is such a deep and personal issue for some, not all. And, and finally on that point, for a lot of Jewish people who are essentially secular, I'm not talking about religious Jews, secular, Israel is their religion. It's become their religion. And how a lot of people feel about religion is you really can't criticise your religion. So therefore, if, you, if your religion is Israel or Zionism, if you, if you criticise that too much, you've gone beyond the pale. You basically, I remember years ago I was told, um, I'm only Jewish born. Okay, well, yeah, I am Jewish born. But in other words, I sort of gave up that right apparently when I was, after I was born. In other words, I'm not, I'm not committed to the Jewish community because I'm not sufficiently pro-Israel or loving the Jewish state enough, or whatever the, the deluded logic is. So, yes, I'm accused of that, and traitor is, is a mild word. I've been accused of worse. <laughs> um, we'll take a couple of more questions, yeah. um, but we are running out of time. So yeah. maybe yeah. one there, and can we get one over here? Yeah. Because, yeah, we're all running late. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, do you have any idea why there's been so little reporting about, about, well, about spyware used against welfare recipients in Australia, apart from The Guardian, there's very little being reported. Good question. I mean, the short answer is I don't. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I guess that is, yeah, why aren't journalists doing a better job? Well, uh, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, some are just, I don't think it's any particular conspiracy or anything. I haven't spoken to particular journalists about that. That I know, I know, I know what Guardian stuff, Guardian has done some good stuff on that. I've seen that. But I don't know. I think there's probably for some people... As I said before, there is sometimes a reluctance to talk too much about these issues, but I think for some people that just hasn't been a priority for them, I guess. But I don't know. I don't know. I haven't really got a, a particular reason beyond that. I'm not sure. I would ask the journalists who write about those issues, I guess. Okay. Well, there is a one more question over there. I'm sorry, it's going to have to be the last one, everybody. We can have a chat with Edge. He's not rushing off uh, afterwards, but um, because the event is running a bit late. Last question, thanks. Right, I just want to say thank you to Anthony for many points, but in particular the mention of boycott, divestment and sanctions. And um, since you're focusing on technology, I understand that um, the company HP, which we're all able to boycott by when we're looking at our computer technology and our printers and things like this, is this, what, is this a useful tactic? And um, are there any other technology companies that we as individuals can can target. And secondly, of course, you mentioned um, Israel not being accountable. Our politicians are not accountable either, and it's up to us to make them accountable. How can we best do this um, here in Australia? Well, the second question, big question, Jennifer, um, how do you make politicians accountable? Well, I guess elect good ones would be a start, but <laughs> I mean, look, you mean, yeah, I mean, on, on the question of Israel and Palestine, um, yeah, I think still for a lot of politicians, I'm talking about Labor, Liberal, less so the Greens, but Labor and Liberal particularly, and there are exceptions in the Labor Party now, some, not enough. Liberal Party on this issue is frankly a lost cause. Um, there is, I think, still ties back to what Peter was saying before. I think there is still a real reluctance to be too critical of Israel, being accused of anti-Semitism. Many of them have gone to Israel on free trips. The so-called pro-Palestine lobby does some important work, but nothing like the pro-Israel lobby. And there's not really seen as a political price to support Israel. There just isn't. 
Are you likely to lose your seat for supporting Israel? No, you're not. So I guess I think, though, the issue of Palestine, as I've said today and others have said it too, the issue of Palestine isn't just about Palestine. It's a far bigger question than that, not just about the technology which I'm writing about, but the general issues that are happening there are relevant to many other subjects. And I think there's something to be said for making these kinds of questions something that our politicians should think about. In other words, when they're maybe trying to get pre-selection or even running in a seat, these issues should be on the agenda. Why aren't they? The first, just briefly, just the, your first point. HP, for those who don't know, are deeply complicit in the occupation. They're involved in the infrastructure of some of the elements of the technology that um, Israel uses in the West Bank. Definitely boycott them. Definitely. I mean, there are a few other companies here that are operating. I mean, most of the um, boycott, divestment, sanctions, like there's not, for example, huge amounts of Israeli settler wine here. You can find it if you're really desperate in some, you know, Jewish wineries. But, you know, in general, there's not massive, you know, you don't go to your local bottle shop and have a whole, you know, area of Israeli settler wine, thankfully. In other countries, you do. Um, so don't, don't drink Israeli settler wine. I've tried it for work. It wasn't very good. <laughs> Just for research purposes. Oh, we might leave it at that, I'm sorry. We had run out of time. but.